thank you everybody for uh, making it to the office and hi to everyone on on zoom pleasure uh, pleasure to be here so my name is julian i'm the chief evangelist for hugging face that's what the slide says um what i'm doing uh, is meeting traveling quite a bit and uh, meeting with customers trying to explain to them that open source ai is actually the way to go about this ai business and i'm also working with our partners um, we have cloud partners hardware partners and uh, and that's a fair amount of my time as well so in, in this presentation uh, which i'd love to keep as interactive as possible so uh um, please jump in, ask questions, uh, interrupt me. It's difficult for me to keep track of the questions on Zoom. So, uh, yeah, if you uh, if you were uh, would kindly relay uh, the the questions uh, of our friends, I don't want everybody to feel to feel uh, you know excluded from asking questions. But in the room, you have no excuse. Just wave at me or yell at me or throw things at me, okay? And uh, and let's have some uh, some fun and learn together. So. Uh, what I'm going to cover today is quick background on Hugging Face. Uh, we've been uh, doing quite a few things lately. You may not be uh, completely up to speed. And then chat about some of the latest trends that we see on, on LLMs. And so this is where I go uh, super opinionated. And uh, again, I'm, I'm trying to force you to react to some of that stuff to get, get the conversation going. So just have at it. Okay. We're in Texas. We can, we, we can, okay? Don't pull guns, okay? No guns, but all right. That's fine. I don't have mine, so it's not fair. And uh, and we'll do demos, okay? Uh, we'll do demos. I'll show you some of the some of the cool things we've been building. And um, and yeah, and again, answer questions, as, as many as we can. Okay. So quick word on hogging face. So Hugging Face is the home of open source AI, right? Um, in a few years, we've become the, the de facto place where the community comes to find models and data sets and also share them. Okay, who has shared the model on Hugging Face or uploaded a model on Hugging Face? Okay, okay, all right. All of you need, yeah, thank you. All right, we need more, okay? Uh, we always need more. Um, and, um, and, you know, folks, have called us, I guess still call us the, the GitHub of machine learning. I think that's fine. You know, it's, I don't mind the uh, GitHub is cool. So uh, I don't mind the analogy, but you will see we're, we're actually building more uh, and uh, and we're trying to be more than a, a nice collection of models and data sets. So we uh, have all those uh, nice companies as investors as of uh, last summer. So that's good validation for us. Uh, we'll try to put that money to, to good use. For the community and i think more importantly it's really good validation from for open source ai generally right because all those folks uh, almost all of them are also building closed models right and fine you know um it's never black or white and uh, if you are if you came here to hear me talking shit about closed models and yes i it's a meetup so i'll, I'll go a little more french than i used to <laughs> With customers, uh, I'm not gonna do that. Okay, I, I think uh, closed models have their own uh, use cases, uh, and I think open source AI is generally a better idea. But um, anyway, there's probably room for everyone here. So um, the 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 mile high view on Hugging Face, and again, if you looked at Hugging Face a year ago, or if you've been experimenting casually, that's probably what you're aware of. So models and data sets right bottom right corner um an insane number arguably uh, i checked this morning i actually updated the slide this morning so six hundred eighty thousand. it might be six hundred ninety thousand by now but who knows and one hundred fifty thousand data sets okay and so um so all of these are open sourced although they have different open source licenses so please be mindful of that okay not everything is fine for commercial usage but if you pick stuff that has, a, let's say, an Apache 2 or an MIT license or a Llama license, uh, you're, you're good to go. But just, just be careful here, okay? So models and data sets, we call them hugging face models, but it's really not hugging face models. It's community models, right? We're the stewards. Uh, we're the, the model herders. 
we we welcome them we try to take good care of them but they come from the community which means everyone from you know google microsoft uh, meta to universities and startups and and individuals too right um so those data sets and models are the the raw material for your uh, your ai project um the next logical step would be to work with those models and data sets uh data sets and, and through our open source libraries so the most popular one is called transformers uh, it's the one that made hugging face popular but over time we added quite a few more if you go to our repo on github you'll see many more diffusers you may be familiar with is the one for uh, let's say stable diffusion models text to image text to video accelerate is a distributed training made simple uh, and uh, text generation inference tgi i'll come back to tgi later is our own inference server. So it's the one you can use to deploy LLMs, and it's the one we use in our own services and in our cloud integrations. And there are way there are way more libraries. You can you can read about them. Uh, over uh, over the uh, the course of building Hugging Face, we've also uh, implemented a couple of uh, cloud services of our own. So Spaces is basically machine learning demos sure you've seen spaces before small web apps that you can write and host on our infrastructure uh, and uh, to showcase models in a web app not in a Jupyter notebook uh, but you'll get notebooks today um, and inference endpoints as the name implies is a model deployment service and you can one click deploy 99.999% of our models I guess on um, any one of the one three um, any one of the three major clouds Okay, and again, this is a fully managed service, so you deploy it and uh, we take care of everything else. So that's really the, I would say the core, um, the core of the, of the platform. I forgot to mention the enterprise hub, which is basically um, a layer of um, uh, security compliance um, features for enterprise users uh, on top of the existing hub, right? SSO, auditing, all those good things. So that's probably what you know, but there's there's more. So we're not a model building company, but from time to time, there's an opportunity for Hugging Face to actually add uh, new models to the uh, open source uh, collection. And we do that, okay? So Bloom was uh, in 2022, was um, the first open source LLM to compete with GPT-35, very large model. Star Coder, as the name implies, a code generation model. And Edifix is a visual uh, large language model. So you can chat with images, et cetera. Pretty cool stuff. And there will probably be more at some point. Hugging Chat is our open source chatbot. So if you want a, a fully privacy uh, preserving chatbot, this is it. Um, it's based on the curated list of the best open source models, probably six, seven models. We upgrade them all the time so you can actually select the model you want to chat with um and uh from ui to back end to models everything is open source so you could actually grab all the bits and pieces and redeploy them in your uh, in your infrastructure if you want it uh, there's an ios app also so if you have an iphone you can uh, you can chat with the best uh, open source llms on your iphone we have cloud partners um, and as you can imagine with them, we try to integrate our open source ecosystem into cloud um, environments, mostly machine learning services. And we have hardware partners. And as you can imagine, we focus on accelerating training and inference across the board, right? And uh, that, work, that work lives under the Optimum umbrella. Optimum is a collection of open source libraries, um, Optimum Intel, Optimum AMD, et cetera. Um, where we um, provide, um, I would say, transformers-like API with built-in acceleration, right? So hiding all the hardware acceleration, all the SDK complexity, um, so that you just uh, import whatever optimum library matches your hardware, and automatically uh, we accelerate and optimize training and inference, right? And last but not least, um, we have a consulting slash uh, professional services program, which we call expert support. 
And that's where we can engage directly with uh, customers and uh, help them build and help them bring their uh, models to production uh, quicker than they think, hopefully. Okay, um, so double clicking on LLMs a little bit. Um, so all of you here at some point have tried at least chat GPT, right? So maybe that's the only LLM experience you have um, and that's fine. You know, we, we don't need more than that to understand here. So when you work with LLMs, first step is just use them as is, right? Ask a question um, and, uh, and get some kind of answer. So that's fine, that's easy, that's what LLMs are for. But very quickly you realize maybe the answer is correct. Maybe the answer is uh, what you wanted, but not in terms of tone of voice. Um, maybe it's too formal, maybe it's not formal enough, or maybe it's too long. Maybe you wanted a yes or no answer, or maybe you wanted three bullet points, you know, that kind of thing. So very quickly, you need to start providing instructions and this is called prompting. And please do not call prompt engineering, okay? Any prompt engineer in the room? Just asking how, maybe on Zoom, okay, somebody's, okay, you can still, you can always log off and, and, and yell at me on LinkedIn or Twitter, okay? But, or you can hang on and take it. So, uh, so prompt engineering is, uh, there is no such thing. It's, uh, prompting is useful if, you limit yourself to exactly what I said before, which is tone of voice, I would say safety guidelines and um, and output control, right? Brevity, formatting, etc. Okay, that works very well. Um, when it breaks is when you try to teach the model new things through prompting, right? Uh, you think that showing five examples of whatever it is you're after is enough to teach the model how to generalize on every single case. The so-called few many shot prompting. Okay, so that works for very very basic things. It doesn't work for complex things. Okay, and the analogy I take all the time is I never learned COBOL. Okay, I learned a few programming languages, but not COBOL. And I know I don't intend to learn it at this point. So you could show me, let's say you wanted me to become really good at COBOL debugging. You could show me 20 examples of buggy COBOL snippets pointing bugs at me, right? And okay, I could read, and through analogy, because I learned all the other languages, I could say, oh, okay, so the variable here is misnamed. Okay, all right. And here there's a missing comma or something. Uh, and here there's an obvious typo. Okay, all right. So. By analogy, I could I could pick up a few things. Now, show me more complicated examples of you know logic problems or you know keywords that don't even exist in the language, etc. I wouldn't know. And you could show me hundred examples. I would never really be good at this, okay? Because it's shallow knowledge. Few examples will never turn me into an expert, okay? And yet you try and well, you, the community, try to turn vanilla LLNs into legal experts or engineering experts with five examples. I'm sorry, but no, okay? If you need to do that, and a lot of you need to do that, uh, bake new domain knowledge or deeper domain knowledge into LLNs, there's a procedure for this, it's called fine tuning. Yeah, so fine tuning means uh, training the model for a particular task. I want this particular LLM to be able to answer legal questions. Legal questions in the oil and gas domain, okay? Okay, it's a very narrow slice of knowledge. So what you need is probably an inch wide, but you want a mile deep. You will never ask for cooking recipes. You will never ask for poetry. You will never ask for astronomy questions, right? You don't care. Or well, answers, I guess. You will ask the questions. Um, so fine-tuning lets you do that. Then the next level up is called continuous pre-training. So continuous pre-training is pretty much what the name says. So initial training or pre-training is training completely from scratch, okay? So you have a million pages of 
legal documents for the oil and gas industry and you want to build the ultimate LLM for that. Okay, so fine, go and train your model from scratch on that million page corpus and it will be pretty good at this. Okay, that's a big effort. That's an expensive effort. Maybe you don't have a million pages. Okay, maybe what you have is maybe you have a thousand new pages every month. Okay, so you could say, well, can I take my vanilla LLM, train it on a thousand pages? And then maybe next month or in six months, can I train it again on another thousand pages? Incrementally training until you get to something that's good enough? Yeah, or maybe saying, ah, it's good at oil and gas legal, but now I need, you know, uh, nuclear energy legal. Can I, and I would, like to have, I would like to have the same model doing the two things, right? So this is called continuous pre-training, right? So all those techniques are useful. Um, and in parallel of that, there's retrieval augmented generation, which has spread like wildfire, literally. And we'll uh, actually, I will do a rag demo and you'll see, uh, you'll see the benefits of that, right? As you can guess, the higher we go, the, the better uh, the domain adaptation, right? So the deeper, uh, your your you go into you know the answering precisely and with great detail etc. But because nothing's free, the higher you go, the more complicated, expensive, time-consuming it gets. Okay, and I tried. I wanted to provide estimates, like, but I've seen a lot of variability. So, uh, so yeah, it's it's difficult. I, initial training for sure is going to be you know hundreds of thousands of dollars if not millions, right? Um, fine tuning could be very cheap, as we'll see. So, of course, we want to be reasonable. So start at the bottom, evaluate in terms of accuracy, et cetera, and only move up if needed, right? Please. Okay, yeah, let me repeat the question for the folks on the Zoom. So the question is, do you, for uh, fine-tuning and continuous pre-training, do I expect companies to build one model per use case per domain, uh, or, or will we see industry domains? I'm rephrasing a bit, but that's what you okay. meant, right? Will we see industry models coming from play, uh, large players? Um, it's, it's a good question. I think so far the attempts at industry models haven't been super successful. Some companies have tried that, you know, the healthcare domain, the healthcare LLM, the maybe the, uh, you know, uh, legal LLM. Um, I think these are interesting as a foundation for your own fine tuning efforts, right? Because after all, if somebody goes to the pain of, oh, I've got a million pages of legal corpus um, and I clean them and prepare them and train them, that's great. Right. But if you work, you know, if you work at Amazon, okay, and you want to build uh, you know, Amazon.com and you want a legal LLM for the retail domain at Amazon, and even that is probably even too general purpose, right? Because maybe you're dealing with vendors or maybe you're dealing with uh, uh, supply chain partners, right? And there's there's a different take on all of that stuff. So I, it's difficult to see a vendor, an external vendor, training a model that is so good, so relevant on all your awkward domain knowledge and specific vocabulary and product names and policies. It would be so great that you would use it out of the box. So healthcare might be different because again, it's a, there's a lot of public knowledge knowledge there's a lot of public reports research reports but would it imagine you're working for uh you know Pfizer or there's still a lot of built-in confidential knowledge that you need and how do you inject that into that model remains to be seen so sorry for the long answer but so I would say my my dream scenario would be we see open source LLMs for particular industries, particular businesses, right? Trained on as much public data that is as is available out there. And then companies take that and fine tune on their, on their data. But I'm, again, it's never black or white. So I'm sure some industries 
would work with an industry model uh, because 99% of the knowledge is out there, right? Research activities and okay. who knows what, right? Please. Yeah, for the folks in the Zoom, uh, the slide is cutting off on the right side of the slide. Right, sli right side of the slide is cut off. Oh. Not sure if it's just me or everybody. Wait. Uh, let me... Um, no, no, actually, I don't know. Is that the zoom? Uh, is that the real zoom thing? No, they say the rights. Yeah, that's well, just, just yeah. now you, you show the whole slide when you had that little one that it did show the right hand side without being cut off. So whatever you did. Oh, okay. So you work now. Okay. Okay. All right. I don't know. Well, I'll show show the the uh, the ML uh, arrow on the on the side. Okay, it's cut off again. When you uh, yeah, you made it small, it it showed the whole thing, but uh, not now. Okay, I can. Yeah, now we can see it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I I can I can stick to this. Yeah. If, okay. Um. Yeah, is that yeah yeah okay I can see okay all right well, yeah we'll stick to this view if that's okay with you right um, all right yeah we can do it like that sure oh uh, yeah you had a question over there it could be it could be yeah it could be incremental on the same domain or it could be trying to add a few different domains you know it could work it could work i would see mostly improving the same domain right not having to refine tune from scratch which is always boring generally it's let's do a first round evaluate it's working but not for these questions so how do we fix those right uh, those don't really work okay let's add some more examples let's train a little more okay the old ones still work the new ones work a little better and then you until you get to you know good enough right of course you could you could refine it completely from scratch but if you have something that you kind of like already you know you don't want to tear it down and remix the the data sets and maybe the result is widely different so yeah, there are different techniques there. Yeah, Julian, um, you know, um, I've, I've already been hearing about, you know, small language models, you know, it's not complex enough with large language models. And so are we to understand <laughs> that small language models are, are more for like embedded devices or something like that? No, or is no, that... it's, no, yeah. it's, it's, man, I, I, we don't need more buzzwords. Um, All right. So yeah, we call them large language models, and now we call them. Should we call them small large language models, or yeah. whoever invented that, you know, deserves it? Okay. Well, I was just curious because I in hell. So, um, yeah. and 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 they're all large, by the way. I mean, if you compare that to XJBoost models, I mean, they're humongous language models, right? So I think small language models. Now, if I don't know if there's any consensus, but I think large language models would be almost synonymous with closed models like gemini openai claude would be llms and anything smaller than let's say 70 billion parameters is going to be small language model so but it's it's it honestly it is a bullshit definition um so i prefer to to talk about open source versus closed i think that's the that's uh that split i can understand um and you know where's the where's the where's the limit for small right is is 70 billion a small model or is it 13 or is it seven i don't know it's uh um, all right it's, it's, it's I, I i agree with you it's weird i agree with you but you know if we agree that gpt4 is a trillion parameters then okay 70 billion is small right that's i think that's kind of the story there all right um okay so uh yeah so 
you're probably there, right? You're probably in that um, orange box. Well, that's where most of the customers are anyway. So starting with prompting, adding rag, we'll see why in a minute. And, uh, and eventually, I guess, doing some fine tuning for further adaptation. That's the majority of customers right now. So let's double click on RAG and do maybe the first uh, the first demo here. Um, yeah. So that's the high level architecture for RAG. Okay. Um, is is anybody seeing this for the first time in their lives? Which is completely fine. Yes, fine, no problem. We're here. So what RAG is is basically adding external data to the mix for generation, okay? So instead of relying on what the, the LLM knows, what the LLM has been trained on, which is generally too old, right? You know, what's the weather? I mean, do I need a raincoat in Austin tonight? Um, sorry, I've I, my cutoff date is September, 2021. So, <laughs> okay, yeah, no, I, you know what I mean, right? There's no freshness here. So the only way you can get freshness and the only way you can add confidential data from your company that obviously was never found and should never been found in, uh, in LLM training sets is by having this external source of truth, right? So you take, and that's the ingestion process, okay? So you take that data, you run it through an embedding model. We'll see what that is. You, trans you turn that data into high dimension vectors. Okay, so it's text, let's say, text paragraphs to high dimension vectors, and you store those vectors in some kind of backend, okay? And then when a user asks, asks a question, the first thing you do is convert the question into high dimension vector, run similarity search between the query, the vector query and your embeddings, okay? And retrieve, let's say the top five or top 10 vectors that match close that closely match the query okay and these will correspond this will match to the documents that hopefully have the information that store uh, the answer okay and so you pull those documents back and the prompt and you will see it in a demo in a minute the prompts look something like uh as a friendly AI assistant please answer the following question blah 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 using document oh, using context found in the following document and this is how you can inject information that happened five minutes ago and information that is very private and very confidential to your org. Okay. So this looks like a really complicated slide, right? And so I'm going to show you how to do this in a single notebook. Yes. Yeah. No, you, you could in the, it, these are different things. Uh, RAG brings freshness of data plus access to company data. Okay. And uh, it's a good first thing to try. And then you could say, if I want to make this better, maybe I can fine tune the LLM or tone of voice, right? I want the, the LLM to tell me stories in a particular tone of voice. Uh, if you write, you know, if you build, let's say, an oncology chatbot and your LLM sounds like an excited teenager, that's not flying, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm delighted to tell you about Mr. Jones's cancer. What? No. Okay. And, and prompting can help with that, but maybe at some point you still want to bake that behavior into the model. And you could also fine tune the embedding model, the one you use for, um, for vectorization. Uh, to again to specialize it for your particular domain. So yeah, it's again it's generally you will try RAG first because you need fresh company data, and for further accuracy, let's say you will do function. You need all of them. These are all the knobs you can you can turn. Right. In the end, you need prompting, you need RAG, you probably need fine tuning. 
but more than anything, you need to know what happens when you turn prompting to 11 or, you know, fine tuning to zero. Because if you have no sense of this is the effect that thing has, then yeah, you can keep twisting that thing and, you know, you're going to break things more likely, right? Okay, let's look at, and I don't know why my screen is turning dark now. It's kind of crazy. Um, give me a second. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, where is my notebook? Okay, so, yes. Can you read or, yeah, is it large enough? Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> you're saying no. <laughs> you have glasses like me, right? Okay, let's try it a little more. So, um, so what I'm going to do here is exactly what you saw on that slide. Okay, I'll let me come back to this for a second. So I need two models. Okay, so I need an LLM. So I'll deploy an LLM on SageMaker, Amazon SageMaker. And I need an embedding model, which I will run in line. Okay. My ingestion process will be three PDF files. Okay, we'll see that. And I will use, uh, I won't use a proper database. I will use an in-memory library. I'm going to use uh, Face from Facebook. Uh, but you could use, I have another demo where I use open search, et cetera. And I'm use, using LangChain to run everything, hopefully. Okay, so let's take it step by step. So first I need to deploy my LLM, okay? So that's what I'm doing here. Uh, so I'm deploying the, the, the latest uh, version of uh, Mistral 7B. All right, and that's the full code. There's nothing else. So this show also shows you the SageMaker integration for Hugging Face, right? And you can do this for the huge majority of models on, on, uh, on Hugging Face. So just define what model you want. Okay, create a hugging face model object in the SageMaker SDK, call deploy. Here I'm deploying on a small GPU instance. Okay, so when people tell me, oh, uh, deploying LLMs is, is a project, uh, what do you mean it's a project? It, it is not. And you know what? Um, it's even better because if we look at this model on the hub, we click on deploy. SageMaker, this is the code. We actually generate the code for you. So all you have to do is copy and paste. Okay, and that's the GPU code. And if you want to deploy on the, on the AWS Inferentia 2 chip, uh, you have the code too. Okay, so don't tell me it's complicated to deploy LLMs on AWS. It has, It is as simple as that. Okay. Oh, no, that's not the right one. Uh, nope, still not the right one. Uh, I've got the wrong window. Yeah, here. We go. Okay. So we wait for a few minutes and we have Mistral 7B deployed. Yes. Are you going to say EC2? No. The, the door's here. No. No, seriously, no. But would it be possible for oh, you to repeat the oh, questions? Yeah. But, but don't don't count on me for that. You know, it's like in 2024, if you if you are telling me you will be great at building an inference container or or whatever, and, and you're gonna do it yourself on EC2 or EKS, you know, I wanna I wanna cry. You know, it's there's zero reason to do that, okay? If you want to grab the model on Hugging Face, reinvent the wheel in terms of compute environment on EC2, EKS, ECS, on-prem, whatever, be my guest, okay? And that's my diplomatic way of saying it, and don't push me because I'm going to be too French for you, okay? Yeah, no, seriously, it's... I'm super happy with copy paste, wait for seven minutes and have a scalable production grade LLM in the cloud. 
right? And that's what we've been building with AWS for three years. So I'm not telling you this because we fell in love with it, you know? It's just that, you know, come on. Uh, it's like five years, six years ago, people telling me, oh, I can't really use DynamoDB, you know, because it's different. And uh, in, in fact, we have our own uh, in-house NoSQL database online. Yeah, that sounds awesome. You know, like the rest of us, we're very happy with cloud services. Okay. Um, hey, Julian, a couple of requests coming in from our online friends. Please. If it's possible to share the link for yeah, this. Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the other one is that if you can repeat the questions coming from the room. Oh, that... yeah, sure. Well, the question is, I don't want to do SageMaker because I love to reinvent the wheel on EC2. How do I do it? Right? So uh, the answer is go do it. You, you know, you don't need me. Uh, I'll copy the... Um, yeah. Give me a sec. Uh, this is it. I'll put it, uh, where is the chat box for this thing? No. If you uh, go to, oh, where is your Zoom interface? If you oh. click on, yeah. Hmm. You know, Zoom keeps on changing their thing. Oh, uh, this one, I guess, yeah, no? Let's see. No, no. Uh, do you see so any? I'll say, I'll, I'll say, yeah, I'll send all the links oh, to. Don't no worry. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry. No problem. Oh, here it is. No, it was hidden. Okay, it's here. Okay, okay. Here it is. Yeah, here it is. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, okay, so we have the LLM. Okay. So now it's a SageMaker endpoint. So we need to plug this thing into Langchain, okay? So it, it, it's not too difficult. What this really does is Langchain needs to know how to uh, serialize and deserialize information coming from the endpoint, okay? Because every endpoint is a little bit different. So this is what it looks like. You need a content handler. Uh, turn the input to JSON. Transform the output from JSON and take into account the prompting format for Mistral, which requires those uh, instant slash inst tags, okay? Honestly, that's a, that's a detail, don't worry about it, okay? So now Langchain knows, right, through this, Langchain knows, oh, okay, that's a SageMaker endpoint, I know, I know how to send it data, I know how to retrieve data, okay? It's really plumbing. So we could try asking a question, right, directly. So. Here, let's say, as a helpful energy specialist, please answer the question, focusing on numerical data, don't invent facts. If you can't provide a factual answer, say you don't know what the answer is. In other words, don't invent silly shit, okay? And create a template, create a chain, and then ask a question, what is the trend for solar investments in China in 2023 and beyond, okay? And here's, so run, the chain which sends the the query to the model and uh and just print uh if i print everything it prints the prompts and all kinds of silly things i don't need so i just want the answer Here's, it's actually not such a bad answer it says i don't have real-time data or the ability to predict future events so so much for ai yeah however according to the international energy agency blah 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 okay so this is actually a good, this is the best case scenario. The model doesn't know, it's telling you it doesn't know, it's trying to do its best based on what it's been trained on, but it's not hallucinating, it's not, which is why Mistral is a good model, you know? It's not pretending to, be, but still, it's not a great answer, okay? So, let's add rag, okay? So Because now we just ask the model, so, I'm just grabbing three PDF files from the International Energy Agency. Okay. Um, copying them to S3, right? We see them here. And then I need to extract the text from those PDF files. So, and I'm very lazy about this. 
Uh, and as it happens, there is an AWS service to do this, which is called Textract. So that's what I'm doing here. So asking Textract, hey, extract all the text from those three PDFs, okay? And, uh, and chunk them, so split them in 256 byte chunks, okay? So we see we ingest uh, oh, 600 pages or something, right? So it's it's a good amount. Took a few minutes. So now I have thousands of chunks, text chunks coming from those docs, okay? So I have this chunked. Now I need to run it through the embedding model to turn that stuff into vectors, okay? So I need an embedding model and I'm gonna grab a small embedding model on the hugging face, right? So it will take the text and output a high dimension vector, right? So download this, again, length chain as the, an object for that, very simple. And now embed all those chunks, right? So run every single chunk through the embedding model, generate that high dimension vector, and store it in, into my face um, in memory database, okay? And I can save it because I don't want to do that again and again. So once I've done that, and you see uh, it's very fast, right? Two seconds. Now I've built this, okay? So all my chunks have become vectors and I can now hopefully retrieve them. Okay, so let's go away. Okay, so now let's configure, let's put all those things together, right? So I'm going to use my collection of vectors as my source of truth. Okay, I'm going to retrieve 10 chunks every time I query. My template looks something like this, okay? So same prompt as before with the user question and the context. And the context will be the 10 chunks I retrieved from the backend, from the face collection. Okay, put all those bits together with another chain. And I can ask the question again, okay? What is the trend for solar investment in China in 2023 and beyond? Okay, so exact same question, except this time, we're going to embed the question, use that uh, embedded query to find the top 10 documents that closely match this, retrieve them, and inject them into the prompt, just like we saw here, the context. Okay, and here's the answer. Based on the provided context, it is expected that solar investment in China will continue to be significant in 2023 and beyond. In 2023, approximately 380 billion is expected to be invested in solar globally, blah, 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 blah. And I see more numbers, okay? Much better answer, right? Okay. And the model is actually telling me based on the provided context. So it says, well, whatever I'm telling you after this is actually based on what I retrieved. So if my retrieval model did a good job Bam, I hit the jackpot here, okay? And I could ask the model, hey, you know, quote the exact, you know, quote the page you found this information in. And I mean, this is just a very simple demo here, okay? So this is RAG in action, right? So like I said, RAG in a notebook, right? Very simple, not crazy scalable, but good enough to get started, right? Good enough to get started for sure. And exactly what we see. Okay, so LLMs from the trenches. So in the last eight, nine months, I have met something, something like 250 customers, I would say. Okay, uh, 200, 250. And this is a bit of a summary of that. So retrieval augment generation, which we just saw. So it's everywhere, okay. Um, so like, it, like I said, if it's the first time you hear about it tonight, well, you can go home happy because you'll learn something super useful, right? 
if it is really the first time, then keep learning about rag. It is everywhere. It's a super popular technique. It works. Uh, you can see it for yourself. Even my stupid notebook demo already shows rag works on just a few hundred pages. Yes. I, RAG doesn't change the model. There is no training involved, right? The models I deployed in the in the previous notebook are just vanilla models. No further training. Okay, so means cheap, simple, right? So the thing is, a lot of people do RAG, but I don't think they fully come to the right conclusions. So. As we saw, the knowledge, the fresh knowledge comes from the external source of truth, right? Not from the model. We saw that very clearly. The model doesn't know anything about coal in China in 2023. You can't blame it, you know? It's, and this is 2023. If you ask about 2024, you know, you can't expect the model to know all the new stuff. Fine. What this really means is the model is just a writing assistant. Right? Here's my question. Here's the context. Write me a good story. Right? Use that knowledge to write a story based on my guidelines. Which means if you're not using the built in knowledge of the model, why would you want to work with a very large model? Because a very large model is large because it has more parameters. Why does it have more parameters? Because it stores more knowledge. Okay, so when I see folks doing RAG with, you know, 70 billion models, I'm a little skeptical, right? And then the first question I ask is, have you tried smaller models? Because you are probably overspending to, to run inference on a model that you don't fully use in terms of, you know, built-in knowledge. So Mistral is 7 billion, but you could probably go lower than that. Um, particularly Microsoft has released um, a family of models called Phi, P PHI, uh, Phi 3, actually, the latest ones, which are, you know, there are different sizes. I think the small one is 3.8 billion, 3.4, 3.8. And it's a very good candidate for that. Because you don't need a ton of built-in knowledge, right? The model will never know what you want it to know. So, Let's just go and use smaller models and save. Um, the next thing I want to touch on is context size. Okay, so AI marketing in action. Big numbers. Uh, Mistral here is, uh, and the others typically have, let's say, 8K context, which means you can pass 8,000 tokens, right? Roughly let's say 7,000 words, right? Some people want you to believe that you need way more than that. You need 100K context. You need 1 million context, 10 million, right? Somebody will say 100 million before I'm home. So uh, this is complete, complete bullshit. Uh, I think people don't understand what 100,000 tokens mean. So the typical novel, Okay, is a hundred thousand words, so that would be let's say one hundred thirty thousand tokens for English. So, if you're passing a hundred thousand tokens, we're talking a full novel. Okay, so two hundred, two hundred fifty pages, and then you're asking a question. So my question to you is, what is the use case for this? Okay, I keep asking everybody. Okay, no one comes up with a reasonable answer. Some VP the other day told me, oh, yeah, but, you know, for code reviews, we can pass 100 pages of code. And I'm like, is this how you run code reviews? I mean, I've done a lot of code reviews in my life. Um, I don't think we've looked at more than 10 pages, right? Oh, yeah, but if, and I'm like, okay, if. So if you need that. Then go and use the crazy large context size, which is, of course, crazy expensive and crazy slow, but no one ever tells you that. In the meantime, for, for the other 99.99% of usage, 
can you please use 8K or 16K context and save a ton of money and latency? So please don't fall for that, okay? Please don't fall for that. Okay, next item, model customization. So if we had met, let's say a year ago, and you had told me, uh, fine tuning, right? I wanna fine tune your a 7B model. I would have told you, yeah, you can do that. And it's gonna cost you maybe 10,000 to $20,000. Not for everybody, right? Now I would tell you, with a straight face, you can do it for 10 to $20, okay? And it's a fact. Yes, I said 10 to 20, I see you're doing what? Yes, fine tuning, fine tuning, not, yeah, yeah, the real thing, fine tuning. <laughs> and the reason for this is because of a class of techniques called parameter efficient fine tuning or PEFT, okay? Another acronym, if you want to sound smart, now you know RAG and now you can say PEFT, right? And you can put AI in your job title and you know more than 90% of people. Uh, so, and, and those techniques are called LoRa and QLoRa, and I'm not gonna go too deep into that, but what they do is instead of fine tuning 100% of the model, you only, so all the model weights, which will take time, right? You, you fine tune, let's say 0 0.1 or up to maybe 1% of the model right and you literally just tweak 0.1 percent of the model and you get very close to the results that you would have gotten with full full-on fine tuning. Okay? yes it sounds like magic and it, it is it's math actually so it is magic okay so that's why i'm saying it dropped a thousand x because if you're only fine tuning 0.1 percent it's a thousand x uh fewer parameters so about about the same uh, factor for uh, cost. So yeah, I've got demos. You can you can find them on my YouTube channel. Fine tuning Llama two for five dollars, and and uh, it's pretty it's pretty cool. Another problem to solve on fine tuning was um, so everybody has learned uh, about uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback, RLHF. It's it's amazing. It's what made made ChatGPT amazingly good, but HF is difficult, you know, human feedback means you need humans. So you need a task force to look at what the model generates and fix it, okay? No, yeah, that's kind of an okay answer, but this is actually a better one. So next time you train, keep in mind, this is the better answer, right? So you need folks to do that. Um, and even if you have folks to do that, some things, sometimes things go wrong, right? Uh, remember the Google model? Um, from a few weeks ago, you know, I'm, I, you know, we're from, I'm from Europe, right? So I can be sarcastic about this, but uh, you know, we had Nazis in Europe a few years ago. Uh, we still remember what they looked like and they didn't quite look like what Gemini was generating, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, right. Sorry, sorry. Um, I think we would remember, right? I think we would remember if they looked like that, but anyway. So that's not AI failure, that's human failure. It's uh, alignment gone wrong, probably with good intentions, but you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, as we say. So alignment is a problem. So if we could get rid of human feedback, not only would we make it simpler and faster to uh, give models feedback, and we hopefully would eliminate you know, misalignment. So there are lots of good techniques. Uh, they have crazy names, DPO, PPO, ORPO. They all end with O because it's optimization. Um, this would be another four hour talk. Uh, if you're curious, you can go and read those blog posts by Argila. Uh, they tell you everything you need to know. And last thing I want to mention is this thing called model merging. Who has heard of model merging? Yeah, it's still, it's still quite new. So it's exactly what the name says. So you're not training anything. You're taking models and you're running averaging on them. Model A, you know, 20% of model A plus 80% of model B, literally averaging weights and bam. So yeah, I've got the, the mass model and I've got the code model and I've got the legal model and I average all of them to have 
a model that can do math code and legal. Yes, it sounds crazy. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, they're they're very impressive. The, the results are very impressive. Uh, yes, um, the library to do this is called Merge Kit. Um, go go check it out. Uh, I actually did also a video on the different merging techniques, where there's some intuition on how they work. Uh, and I have links to the papers, and the papers are benchmarked where they literally do that. Zero uh, seconds, seconds on on your laptop because it's just it's literally av averaging weights. So there is no training whatsoever. You don't need GPU. So that's the appeal because you can you can start from hundreds of thousands of models on Hugging Face and cherry pick the ones that have the knowledge that you like and build a model that has all of them. Now it could be 70B, it could be... It's, no, no, it's, 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 a, it's just a, a simple algo, honestly. It's, it's, there is no training involved, you don't need GPs. It's literally loading model weights and averaging them out. So mixture of experts. Um, so the question is, is how is this different from mixture of experts? Mixture of experts is you 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 train different copies of the same model, okay, in parallels, hoping that they learn different things. Yes, and, and some yeah, it's at training time. So you have eight, sixteen copies of the same architecture trained in parallel, slightly different ways, so that they pick up different things. And then at inference time, you pick a subset. So you predict with only two of the experts or only four of the experts, which saves on latency, but you still need to load everything and you still need it to train everything. So still very intensive. Um, merging is just model A, model B, model C, um, different weights on those models, build me a single model in the end, right? It is crazy. You have to, I never fully trusted it. And uh, I don't know if I fully trust it, but, if I trust the papers, the results are pretty impressive. And the compute is seconds. I'm sorry? Uh, the question is, how do you control for hallucinations? I don't think it's really different. Um, you would still need to run evaluation. You would still need to run the same QA on your model. Um, it's yeah i think the, the the appeal of merging is um I, I have lots again there are tons of models out there so I, I have probably enough knowledge out there but it's in different models right so i'm going to cherry pick stuff that makes sense for my use case and uh, and build you know build a model that has those capabilities but of course you still need to test it We're, we'll get to that okay we'll get to that okay so real quickly the rest is more i would say uh is important but it's a little more straightforward so this year is about moving stuff to production right we still experiment but people want results they want to see ai in action and not just ai pocs okay so that means cost performance is everything so if you're not evaluating um if you're not thinking about you know your latency budget your throughput expectations if you're not thinking about the expected roi target for this project you will be disappointed you know that stuff doesn't fix itself you need to work at it okay if you don't think about that then you will have a very nice poc but that can't scale or it's, it's too slow or is way too expensive okay uh, and keep in mind, inference is the uh, is the the huge cost here, not training. Okay, fine tuning is very cheap now. Uh, model merging, if if that becomes successful, will eliminate training cost. So in the end, what's left is inference, right? 
And that's, I keep saying inference is forever. The model is deployed. It stays there until, you know, till the project dies, but that could be years away and it needs to scale according to traffic. So if you are not thinking about optimizing your inference cost, you're not thinking about cost performance. Okay. And in terms of hardware, um, yes. Yeah, you can have adapters, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm, I won't get there. Yeah, but sure. There, there's a lot of work you can do on inference optimization. So uh, if, you're, if you're not considering it, you are missing out, okay? So, I mean, don't lose any sleep, you know, on the first week of the project, but it needs to be on your map at some point. Um, yeah, not just NVIDIA GPUs. I mean, they're rich enough. That's okay. Um, there's not enough of those. They're crazy expensive uh, and there are alternatives now. So there's this company called AMD, right? You know about them, okay? Uh, they have a really good GPU, which is the MI300, which is hitting the clouds at the moment. So go and check that out when you can. We like it a lot and we see uh, better cost performance there. The AI accelerators from AWS and the other clouds are equally interesting. Okay, so go and check that out. If you listen to me and try to use small models, then you should be able to use mid-range GPUs, which are plentiful. Um, for example, G5 instances on AWS, about a dollar an hour, perfect for seven, eight billion parameter models, which are really the sweet spot right now. No need to go any bigger than that. Uh, you can find, you know, as many as you want, you can scale out. This is a, a best. The best option, I think. And of course, local uh, CPU inference is quickly becoming a thing. Um, and you know, we work with Intel and AMD and we see uh, a lot of work being done there on, um, on CPU inference and the model optimization for local inference. The major blocker here is the, the companies who build models need to find a way to charge you for local inference. Right? Why uh, why isn't GitHub Copilot a local thing? There's no reason for it, right? It could be local, but they need to be able to charge you for that. Once they figure out how to get your $20 a month on a laptop, you'll have a local copy, right? Trust me. All right. Um, yeah, we we'll, don't need to cover that. Um, so how do we know which models are the good ones? So. We have this thing called the leaderboard, the LLM leaderboard, which everybody is trying to game and because apparently getting to the top of that leaderboard is a thing. Uh, competition, right? So let me go full screen. I hope, yeah, because there's nothing on the right. Okay, yeah, because it's too small otherwise. So this is the version from March 20th, as you can see, okay? So I know it's busy, but what you see here is models pre-trained pre models, 7 billion parameter and slower. <laughs> Smaller, <laughs> not slower. They would be faster. Okay, 7 billion, it's jet lag hitting, hitting my brain. 7 billion and smaller, okay? So Google Gemma 7B, Quen 7B, Microsoft Phi 2, blah, blah, blah. And the best one is 63.75. I actually updated this slide this morning, especially for you, because I thought, man, this is way, way too old now. Okay. So this is this morning. Okay. Same screen, 7 billion and smaller pre-trained models. So 5.3 Microsoft is at the top, 69.86 average. Okay. Higher is better. We don't care what those models are what those uh, numbers are. 
Google GMO is still doing well. Llama 3 popped up, okay, came out mid-April. Uh, Quen is still here. Mistral is lower down the list, okay? So that's, okay, that's two months, okay? Arguably, May was busy, okay? I'll give you that. April, May was a busy, a busy time for new models, but that's the pace of innovation there. Okay, so you can't sit uh, for for twelve months and hope that whatever you have in production today is still great in twelve months, right? It will still do the job, but chances are there's a much better model that has already come out. I'm not saying you should upgrade every week or every even every month. What I'm saying is you should definitely keep an eye on the new models and and measure. How far ahead is this new thing on our data, not on the benchmarks? Run evaluation on your data. And there comes a time where the gap is large enough that you will want to switch. Okay. But coming back to my original obsession on prompting, if you wrote those very elaborate prompts, right? Do you think they will still work the same? Right? If you were on, let's say, Gemma 7B, and you now switch to 5.3 mini 4K instruct, whatever the name is, do you think the prompts work the same? M maybe, maybe not. I'm, I can tell you the longer they are, the more domain specific they are, you know, the, the more dangerous they are. So you will rewrite that stuff. So prompts are technical debt. You need to know that. Okay. They are technical debt. It's a shame that you have to rewrite all those things again and again. So if you keep the prompts generic, you, you'll be in a better place. I would actually recommend that even if you picked, let's say, Gemma 7B, right? Let you try your prompts on Mistral and Phi 3 and two, three different models, like regression testing, right? And check the different answers automatically. Compare the answers automatically. If you see very, very different answers, something might be off. Maybe you went too far into prompting. If you see reasonably similar answers, okay, right? Um, so quickly, um, for performance, tokens per second, memory usage, et cetera, we have the performance leaderboard, right? Um, which helps you find um, the right model size and for your infrastructure, your latency, et cetera. We have an embedding leaderboard. We saw embeddings were how important they were for uh, RAG, right? Embeddings are really cool again. Lots of new models coming out um, and, uh, and we have a leaderboard specifically for that as well, okay? Specifically for embeddings fans, um, this came out uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, so sentence transformers version three zero major release. So sentence transformers are uh, another uh, another library um, that we steward specifically for embedding models. Okay, so if you if you are uh, you know if you are deep into embeddings, uh, you you want to read about this new release. Okay, uh, so last thing I want to say. And then we'll call it a night is this, okay? So there's a lot of obsession about models, okay? I'm actually not super interested in models myself. I think what you use today is not what you will use six months from now. And if I look at the models from six months ago, like Llama 2, right? which was amazing, amazing. It was, a, it was a breakthrough. Llama 2 came out in July 23, okay? If you are using Llama 2 in production today, people would throw rocks at you, right? And that's July, okay? So it's not even a year ago, okay? Mistral was even better in September. You would probably not use Mistral in production today. Or if you were, you would certainly look at migrating to maybe Llama 3 or something else, right? And 
six months from now, probably you won't be using Llama 3. Okay, so take, look at the leaderboard, take the, evaluate the three, five LLMs at the top, right? Uh, get value out of them, but don't fall in love. You will throw them away. Um, the secret sauce is the data, okay? The data, the data, the data, uh, especially if you do RAG and if you do fine tune, okay? The one thing people don't talk about enough is machine learning engineering, okay? That's another nine hours of discussion right there. Um, what I mean by ML engineering is all the under the hood techniques to give you the best cost performance. And so once you have a model that you like, okay, maybe off the shelf, maybe fine tune, how do you squeeze every bit of cost performance out of it? Okay. So faster attention layers, right? Uh, model compilation, model quantization, model merging, uh, and of course, hardware acceleration, all those things um, need to be looked at at some point, okay? Not on the first week of the project, but again, if you are not factoring in those techniques, saying, okay, this is a model I like, I have the business accuracy, and I, you know, I think I can get ROI from this, now, how do I squeeze this thing uh, to make it 2x, 4x smaller, 4x faster, blah, blah, blah? You are missing out, right? Who wants to pass on 2x ROI improvement? Come on. No one. Okay. So I've got lots of deep dives, uh, again, on, on YouTube. Feel free to go check that out. Um, and this is uh, this is a really great place. I mean, if you, if you love tinkering, uh, if you're tired of DevOps or something, this is a great place to be, right? <laughs> I'm more excited about this than anything else at the moment, I have to say. Yes. Um, so the, the question is closed, closed source versus open source. So we were having this discussion. So I think the two things to consider are um, how much domain adaptation do you need and how much scale will you have, okay? So you have this quadrant. So low scale, low domain adaptation, um, I, ha I need an AI tool for my marketing department to make their, whatever they do, uh, product pages, you know, better, blah, blah, blah. or my HR team wants to summarize resumes, blah, blah, blah. And they're not going to do that 50,000 times a day. And it's not very domain specific at all. Great. Go, honestly, it's a bit of a boring project too. So get it out the door with uh, a model API, uh, go use you know Amazon Bedrock, uh, whatever model works for you there, fine. Get it out the door in a few days, move on to smarter things, okay? And low scale means that cost isn't really a problem anyway. Paper token is overpriced, okay? But I, I tell you all the time, if, if this thing costs $500 a month, there is no incentive to make it 50, right? Engineering time is precious. So let them spend 500 and move on, okay? So that's low scale, low domain adaptation. Then you have high scale, low domain adaptation, okay? You need to translate um, 10,000 pages of text every day, right? And it's not super domain specific. So what do you do then? Well, if you want ROI from this thing, you need the smallest possible model, right? So sure, you can translate with, uh, with GPT-4 or Claude, et cetera. But then, you know, if that thing costs you 10,000 a month, there might be an incentive to make it, you know, 1,000. Okay, so as soon as you have scale, you need to consider the benefits of as much smaller and much less infrastructure to support it, 
okay? Then you have high scale, high domain adaptation, which is a no brainer, okay? Um, again, high scale means the smallest model possible and high domain adaptation means you need to, at the minimum to have RAG and probably you need to do fine tuning. Again, you need to finally control what's going on there, which you cannot with those uh, model APIs, even those who offer you fine tuning, okay? And then you have the weirdo, which is high domain adaptation, low scale, where I would think humans can do it. You know, that's probably our, you know, the, the that's probably where we can still exist. Um, because if it's low scale, and high domain adaptation, it means you will probably spend quite a fair amount of time building a good model to solve those hard, those hard questions, but it's only going to be used 10 times a day. So it's like automation, you know, it's honestly, it is like automation. Would you automate a workflow? Would you do cloud formation or Terraform for something you do, you know, from time to time? Is it worth it? Right? I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. Yep. Let's wrap it up with here. Yep. And thank you for everybody for joining. And uh, thank you. So I'll send you the slides. Yeah. Uh, I'll send you the slides. I'll send you the links to the notebooks. Yes. And uh, and yeah, you can you can play with this stuff, right? Great. All right. Thanks everybody. Thank you, thank you everybody on Zoom.